There's this temptation to allow emotion into investing. It makes sense if you think about it though. If fun goes up and our greed and excitement increase a notch and we feel that euphoria, that same fun goes down and fear can kick in causing us to panic. Or maybe we get attached to a specific company or a fund and we don't want to admit that we didn't make the best decision and the path of least resistance is to just stick with our past decision. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. Whatever boat you find yourself in, this video is about understanding some of the mistakes that many investors make with dividend investing. I like dividend investing, but I don't pick teams and become a fanboy. I want the truth whatever it is about any investment decision with the ultimate goal of maximizing returns. So without further delay, here are the five things to watch out for with dividend investing. Okay, so the first pitfall to avoid is the dividend yield trap. I've discussed this in prior videos, but it's this temptation to chase a high yield. But the underlying fundamentals of the company Company are poor. What sometimes happens is the stock price falls before the dividend does. When the price falls, the amount they're paying as a dividend becomes a higher percentage than it previously was, and all of a sudden, we've invested in a company that is going to do nothing for us long term. In this hypothetical example, we went from $100 a share and a 4.5% yield to $50 a share and a 9% yield. The dividend stayed the same, but because the share price went down, it gives an artificial sense of high returns. If we chase the yield and miss the fundamentals, we're likely falling right into a trap. This fall of the stock price is often the result of reduced earnings, which results in elevated payout ratios. That ratio is simply the annual dividend divided by the earnings per share. If we think about it, this makes sense. If you look at your own paycheck, and let's say for easy math, your paycheck is $1,000 and your monthly expenses are $980, this means you have $20 left over. If you turn around and pay out that $20 as a dividend to someone who invested in you, you're left with nothing due to a 100% payout ratio. This is obviously oversimplified, but understanding the principle is key here. Take for example UNCH. A quick look tells us that this has a whopping 9.74% annual dividend. Who doesn't want a nearly 10% dividend? So if we look at their earnings per share, they're at $1.74 for a trailing 12 months. So we can take the $2.68 dividend and divide it by the $1.74 and we get 1.54, which is 154% payout ratio. They're paying out more to shareholders than they made, which means they're draining their accounts dry or are likely funding it with debt if the accounts haven't already been drained. Very soon this dividend will be cut because what they're doing now is unsustainable. As a rule of thumb, we want to stay at a dividend payout ratio of 75% or less. We also want to compare a stock to its competitors. If all competitors are offering a dividend of 2%, we should see some red flags at double or triple that being offered. The theme here is that the dividend cannot be the only thing that we consider. Next is taxation. The IRS will make sure that you pay massive taxes unless you hit the like button. It's your get out of jail free card with the IRS. <laughs> Dividends are not the most efficient when it comes to taxes because they're double taxed. Think about it like this. We want to reduce the amount of friction that exists between money out there getting into our account. Double taxation makes this a bit difficult. Companies turn a profit, they must turn around and pay a 21% tax on their profit. What's left over is used generally for three things. The company can buy back shares, they can reinvest in the company, or they can issue a dividend to their shareholders. We as the shareholders in many circumstances have to pay a tax on the dividend that was already taxed when it was profit from the company. So when do we pay taxes and when do we not? The answer comes down to whether the dividends are qualified dividends or ordinary dividends. It also depends on your income. If you just did your taxes, take a look at your 1099 div. Boxes 1A and 1B will tell you which is which. The distinction matters. Qualified dividends usually mean it was paid by a US company or a qualifying foreign company. They cannot be excluded by the IRS. Additionally, we also must have held the stock for 61 days or longer in a 121 day period. And we also must have held it for 61 days or longer before the ex-dividend date, which is the day before the dividend date. If we're good so far, we qualify for a long-term capital gains tax rate. From the IRS, this is the AGI table, which is the adjusted gross income table. After your taxes are complete, the first $44,000 is untaxed for singles, and the same goes for married filing jointly at $89,000. In reality, your income can actually be a bit higher than this because of the standard deduction. If you itemize, you could easily make six figures and still, after all credits and deductions, qualify for zero in capital gains taxes. Once you cross over those thresholds, you pay taxes on your dividend income at 15% all the way up to $490,000 for singles and $553,000 for married filing jointly. Beyond that, the taxes increase again to 20%. So what happens if the dividends are ordinary dividends? Then we pay ordinary income taxes according to whatever your tax rates are. If we're getting paid dividends from a real estate investment trust, a master limited partnership, or employee stock options, those are ordinary. If we bought a stock 
stock 50 days before the ex dividend date, that's an ordinary dividend. The bottom line is that taxes are a fact of life, and a portfolio that is heavy on income is going to have to deal with taxes. It's not the end of the world, and I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in stocks with high dividend yield, but it's very different from aggressive growth stocks that don't pay a dividend sitting in our Roth IRA just compounding yearly. Another risk we run into with dividend investing is inferior returns for the sake of the dividend. Dividends are low right now compared to interest rates. We've become so used to lower returns on our money that a dividend of 3% seemed like a great return. With interest rates going up, you can get 3.5% without even looking hard. Bankrate has a list here, and who knows, maybe some of these are introductory teaser rates, but we're seeing some of these crack the 5% mark. So my point is this, we as investors have to evaluate the risk for literally everything. There's risk with any decision we make. So if we're dabbling in single stocks for a 4% dividend, or we're throwing large amounts of our money into a novel ETF that's paying a 6 or 8% dividend with no track record, these investments can go to zero. They can even drop by 50% like some did in 2008. If we put our money with a bank and can earn a guaranteed 4% or even 4.5%, then I think we have to at least acknowledge the risk and at least if we're doing nothing else emotionally and mentally, prepare for it. Okay, and the fourth consideration with the dividend is that when a dividend is paid out, there's an adjustment made to the share price by the amount of the dividend. Here's an example. Let's look at Johnson & Johnson, which is a massive company with a market capitalization of half a trillion dollars. Their yearly dividend amount came out to $4.52. On a quarterly basis, that's one thirteen. So if we look at the closing price, where on February 16th, it was $158.24 a share at close. But if we subtract the dividend amount of one thirteen, it has something called an adjusted close, where the share price is reduced to $157.11 which is the exact amount of the dividend. Now the thinking is that the company will continue to produce value and grow and that share price will recover. And I'm sympathetic to that argument, but numbers don't lie and like I said at the beginning, we cannot think with our emotions here. That money doesn't just magically reappear, so it does provide some headwinds to the stock price that we have to consider. It will very likely absorb that minor hit and continue its upward climb, but we can't pretend it didn't happen. Okay, and the fifth and last one is that there's this idea of living off of dividends is the only solution to retirement. Most dividends being paid right now from really solid ETF or good companies are in the 1% to 4% range. If we go by the Trinity study of safe withdrawal rates, 4% is the recommended number for a 30-year time horizon for retirement. So this means the more optimistic outcome with dividend investing is that we'll get just barely enough to cover the safe withdrawal rate. If dividends get cut and we're sitting at 2 or 3%, we're going to have to sell stocks to make up the difference or live on less. There's nothing wrong with being willing and prepared to live on less as long as we're realistic about it. My point here is that it's okay to acknowledge that until our portfolio reaches a certain size, it's all right to have to sell a stock to generate income from our gain. If it's a growth stock that's gone up 15% this past year and we're only shaving off 4%, that's still a good outcome. We just have to keep all options on the table and not necessarily confine our thought process to one of dividends only. If you like this video, check out some of my other videos on investing. Thank you and until next time.